everyone, today I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the topic that you see before you on the screen and then I'm going to ask you to try uh, some analysis yourself and then show you where you can find some guidance on uh, answers to the analysis I ask you to do. Uh, so a little bit different than usual, but I think a very valuable thing to keep practicing, right? Uh, keep practicing doing some analysis. And of course, we can take up answers when we next meet in the seminar as well. So the title says Analyzing Discourse in Context. Uh, we, as you know, discourse is the word that's supposed to signal that you're thinking about language, not as some abstract thing where we've just got words on their own, right? Uh, discourse is to remind you that the words exist in a certain context, a certain place, and a certain temporal context at a certain time, and that we use context of time and context of place, as well as words around those particular words that we're analyzing, the co-text, to make sense of what's going on, right? Now, uh, many people have come up with uh, names for, for, for concepts of how to break context down into more specialized parts. Uh, the ones you see before you, situational, interpersonal, and cultural, these I'm using from the work of Joan Cutting, who is uh, an excellent uh, linguist, but also uh, a, a, an excellent writer in terms of communicating things to people. So I think she's really good at that, really makes things easy to understand. She doesn't simplify them and, and make them, you know, too basic, but she communicates them well, right? So I always recommend to people looking at Joan Cutting's uh, textbooks if they if they want extra information. So she says that, okay, uh, situal infor situal, situational information is that information that where we, we understand the language by the fact that it makes reference, it refers to the physical context, right? Where are we? What can we see? What can we hear? What can we smell? Sometimes we think of it as taking a shortcut. We take a shortcut. We don't say everything because of the fact that we're in the same shared space or... Uh, even if we're on the telephone, uh, that we refer to things that we know the other person will understand because of where he or she is, even if she's not with me, right? Uh, so this is reasonably, this is probably the simplest of the three categories, uh, things like this, right? If I point over there and say, uh, you know, can you give me it before I go home or something like that, right? And I'm pointing at something, you'll know what it is, right? That, or can you give me that, right? Um, because we're in the same space, I don't have to say, can you give me the red book that is on the shelf to your left? None of that's necessary, right? I can just say, can you give me that? And uh, pointing at it uh, is enough. Uh, it refers to something in the situation. Uh, but I think, so it's simple, but I think that's a good example of what I said at first about it being a shortcut, right? And all of these work that way, that you don't have to say everything because you're relying on some sort of shared information. In this case, it's information that we share because of the situation that we're in, right? So look at that. It's, you, it's only interpretable. Uh, you may know the term interpretable to refer to uh, changing between languages to interpret one language into another language. Uh, but in linguistics, interpret is often used to mean make sense of, right? If I, if I say to you right now, uh, look at that, you can't, you know the word that, you know what it means, but you can't interpret it, right? What is he referring to? Whereas if I'm in the same shared space as you and I point at something and I say, look at that, you can see what that means because of where my arm is pointing, my hand is pointing. So then you could interpret that, right? So often when we use words like he, she, that, this, and so on, they're only interpretable because we're in the same shared situational context, right? The same physical space. Uh, it's beautiful here. Where is here, right? You only know where here is if you have some shared information about my situation. It, you don't have to be with me, but you have to share that same knowledge of where here is uh, to make sense to interpret here. So it's a shortcut, right? I don't have to say, uh, you know, I'm, it's beautiful in Bermuda where I am now, as you know. 
if you already have that information, that pre-existing shared information, it's much quicker to say it's beautiful here. Uh, only interpretable if you know where I am. This can be both uh, endophoric or exophoric uh, in the text or out of the text. Endo, think of the en as meaning in. Some of you may know these terms, quick reminder, because they're useful, right? Endo, the en is like in. Exo, exo, I don't know why I'm writing it on the table with my finger. You can see it in front of you, exo, exit, out, right? Endophoric means we know from in the text. Where's Nozomi? She's who is she, right? She is interpretable from the term, as the, as the name Nozomi, because you see it in the text, right? Uh, where's Nozomi? Nozomi's coming after work, shortcut. Where's Nozomi? She's coming after work, exophoric. Shige says, who is she? And we look across the restaurant, he's looking, right? So he's, his eyes are directing me to make sense of she, and I look over and say, not Nozomi. Uh, I know who she means here from outside of the text, from out in the world, from looking across the shared physical space of the restaurant and seeing, presumably there's one woman that's distinguishable because she's just come in or something, right, to make sense. There might be more than one she, but I look over, uh, not Nozomi. Uh, but in both cases, right, uh, so exo the exophoric one is the one referring to the situation, right? The endophoric one, you can interpret who, it, who she is from the text, right? She in line three means Nozomi in line two. In the exophoric one, she in line two, we can't figure it out from the words that Shige and I are saying. It's got to be from something else. Ah, it's from the shared physical space. Good. Interpersonal information. Again, shared knowledge, taking shortcuts, not saying everything because we can rely on knowledge that, that we share about each other, right? Uh, that you are often speaking to people that you know, you share interpersonal information with them, specific information about that person or those people, and so you take shortcuts, right? Uh, if I'm talking to my wife about her brother and, and I say, how's Chang? And she says, Chang is Chang. Well, you can interpret that to an extent, right? Chang is Chang, but of course you don't know Chang. So you don't know if you know this means something like Chang now is as Chang always is, but you know people say these kind of things, right? These circular Chang is Chang type things. You know it means he's no different than usual, but of course you don't know him, so you don't know what he's usually like, right? Is he a friendly, happy-go-lucky guy? Is he quite serious and reserved, right? Uh, you can't really interpret it fully, other than to know that it means well nothing special. Uh, you need to know him to make sense of that, right? Think of think of how that's different. Uh, number one, uh, how's Chang? Chang is Chang. That's different than how's your sandwich. A sandwich is a sandwich, right? Um, if someone says a sand, how's your sandwich? If the other person says a sandwich is a sandwich, that's more interpretable, right? Because we can assume most people have had a sandwich, right? Uh, how? Uh, a sandwich, we know that line four means a sandwich. This sandwich, this particular sandwich, is like all sandwiches. So in other words, nothing special. But there you can make more of an interpretation of that because you have that information, right? I assume most of you have had a sandwich at some point, whereas Chang is Chang doesn't work, right? Uh, interestingly, I used to say, for line four here, I used to use the example, a hamburger is a hamburger. Uh, and I said something like, oh, uh, uh, you know, most of us have probably had a hamburger, so we can interpret that a hamburger now is as a, a hamburger at any point, right? That this hamburger is nothing special. But then one student from Westminster said, well, I've never had a hamburger. We don't eat that kind of meat because of my religion. And uh, so there I'd over generalized not interpersonal, well, it's related to the interpersonal, right, because I didn't think of him, uh, I didn't know his religion, so I couldn't guess that, but this also relates to the next thing, shared cultural information, which we'll come to, where you don't, where you make assumptions, not based on knowing that person as an individual, but knowing about the culture of the person or people to whom you're talking, and so you take shortcuts by saying, well, because you're of this culture, you'll know this kind of thing, and I'd 
erred. I'd made a mistake by assuming that everyone had had a hamburger when not everyone has, right? And so I obviously changed it to something that I think is probably more likely that most people will have eaten a sandwich. Uh, but sticking with interpersonal, right, for a bit more, uh, knowing uh, something about the individual, right? Uh, a father, well, me, I'm talking to my daughter and I find myself, or this was more years ago when she was younger, right? But I'd find myself saying things like, do you need your hair done? And she'd say, it's a school day because you have your tie on. And then I'd think, geez, I got to write that down because that, that's a really good example of shared information here. Do you need your hair done? Uh, it's a school day because you have your tie on. How can that be an answer to the question, do you need your hair done? Those of you who went to school in Britain or perhaps in places where schooling is similar in terms of how children have to dress uh, and regulations about hair and so on may be able to interpret this better. You can see what's going on, right? So father me is wearing my tie, uh, therefore it's probably a work day for me because I don't wear a tie when I'm not going to work for the most part. And of course, when I'm working, I don't always wear a tie, but I only wear a tie for work, right? So she can say, ah, because you're wearing your tie, it's therefore a work day for you. If it's a work day for you, it must be a school day for me because you work Monday to when Friday and I go to school Monday to Friday uh, and therefore I need my hair done because children at her school had to wear ponytails. She couldn't leave her hair long and loose. She had to have it in a ponytail and she was too young to do it herself, right? So do you need your hair done? Could be answered simply as yes. But she says it's a school day because you have your tie on and it takes advantage of this fact. And here it's not a shortcut, right? It would be easier to say yes. But here the child gets to display a certain amount of shared interpersonal information to show her deductive reasoning to show her intelligence. So earlier I said we do these things because uh, they're shortcuts. Shortcuts in time, yes. But sometimes here you can think of it as a shortcut in terms of displaying intelligence, right? Of showing off, uh, of showing her, like I said, her deductive skills, right? Uh, so that we do it for various purposes. It's not always just to save time. Uh, it's to make jokes, to avoid talking about taboo subjects. There are various reasons that we do these kinds of things. Uh, but often it just has to do with being quick. Come closer then, I'll do it. Do you want a pony, right? Uh, it's a school day, I need it, right? Based on what I just said, you can probably then interpret that do you want a pony in line five doesn't refer to me buying her a, an animal, right? A ponytail, do you want a ponytail? It's a school day, I need it. I need to have my hair in a ponytail because those are the regulations at my school, right? So that kind of shared information allows us to communicate, uh, to say less in some places, do you want a pony? Or to say more in other places, lines two and three, instead of saying yes, to say the whole thing, it's a school day. Uh, but at all times we understand each other and we know why the other person is saying things differently than the simplest answer. That's probably the best way to explain it, right? Do you want a pony? She'd know I'm saying pony instead of ponytail because it's just quicker and it's a bit of a joke, right? Lines two and three, I'd understand why she's saying more. I wouldn't say Mace, her name is Macy. I wouldn't say Mace, you don't need to say so much. You can just say yes, because I understand that she's trying to show that she's clever, show that she's made that deductive leap by saying it's a school day because you have your tie on. So we use these shared shared information, shared situational, interpersonal, cultural. We, we use them and we expect that the listener will understand why we've done it too. Uh, cultural information, right? Language that makes reference to the mutual knowledge known by members of a specific group. Now, culture doesn't always, for sociologists and social linguists then, and you know anybody involved in studying how humans interact, culture doesn't have to mean uh, you know, big culture, national level culture, right? Uh, Indian culture, Japanese culture, British culture. It doesn't have to be big stuff like that, right? Sometimes we refer to religious culture or even, you know, the, the culture of, uh, I think as I wrote on the handout, you know, uh, you might refer to the culture of surfing, that there's a surfing culture, that there are people who surf, uh, surf on, on boards on the water, have certain cultural knowledge 
that uh, they share, whether they're from country A, you know, whether they're Brazilian surfers or English surfers or what have you, they have this shared knowledge that allows them to communicate about that particular cultural item, about surfing, right? Uh, the example that really caught my attention there is because they talked, I heard some surfers talking about long boards. And obviously I know what long means and I know what a board is, but how long is a board before you call it a long board, right? That meant something more specific to them. And free ride, I heard them talking about a free ride. Does this mean a ride that you don't pay for or what? Well, no, it means something specific to surfers, right? To, to wave surfers. I'm not talking about web surfers, of course. So culture can refer to something like that, right? To a group that share specific practices, specific uh, uh, knowledge of how things work, not just national level, big culture as, as people often think of it, right? Uh, I'm talking, think of this, right? Shared cultural information about, well, about various things, right? I'm talking to a student about an assignment and she says, is that due on November 20th? Simple answer would be for me to say yes or no. And if no, to give her the actual answer. But that I say something like, or not like, I mean, again, I, I take note of these things immediately and write them down, right? I find myself saying no, because that's Christmas. And then the student says, so it must be the week before. And then I think, now, how did that work, right? And if you think, you know, pause if you'd like to th and think about how did she understand uh, me saying no, because that's Christmas. And now that you've paused and come back, uh, you know, because that's Christmas. Christmas is not December 20th. And I can assume most people know that even if they're not Christian, even if they're atheist, People here in the UK, maybe not people all around the world, right, don't know when Christmas is, but people here in the UK would probably know Christmas is December 25th, regardless of religion or not, right? I say no, because that's Christmas, but I clearly can't be meaning Christmas is December 20th, or the student would say, what are you talking about? That's not the right day. So, but she understands that when I say that's Christmas, what I really mean is that's the Christmas holiday, the Christmas break, right? Uh, that it's a shared cultural knowledge of religious holidays or holidays of any type often have no school, no work. If they're particularly major ones, it's not just the day itself, December 25th, but an extended period around the day uh, where people don't always go to school or work. Uh, and, and the fact that it's a university, she probably knows that in fact, it's, it's quite long, right? It's not just two or three days. It's in fact, I, I think the university is usually closed for two whole weeks around Christmas. And then she says, so it must be the week before, because again, shared knowledge of the cultural practices of universities or our university specifically, Westminster, uh, assignments are not ever due when the university is closed. We, we don't ask, it's against the rules, in fact, you may not know that, but you may just think it's a practice that we have, but in fact, against the rules, we're not allowed to set assessments for when the university is closed. So I can't be asking her to submit an assessment on December 20th if that's the Christmas holiday, and therefore it must be the week before. So all this relies on our shared cultural information about uh, religious observances and the holidays that appear around religious observances and the fact that universities have certain cultural expectations about when assignments are due, right? There's a lot packed into there that obviously made sense to, to, to the two of us, but that might not have made sense to an outsider who was not part of the university, who didn't know about religious holidays, who didn't know about Christmas, right? Why should I expect people around the world to know about Christmas? But people here uh, certainly for the most part do, right? Uh, Wells Street building on, uh, well, on Wells Street, the university has a small building, which maybe you've never been to, but we, the university has one there. I go in and I see the security guard and it's pouring rain. And she says, this is the weather we know and love, which you can probably guess is she's being sarcastic, right? Uh, most of us, a shared cultural, bit, bit of shared cultural information, right? People tend not to like the rain, or even if they do, because it's good for their crops, because they're a farmer or what have you, they tend not to like it raining on them, especially when they're going into downtown London to go to work, right? So she says, this is the weather we know and love. And I don't look at her and say, uh, no, I don't like rain. I know she's making a little joke, right? 
and then I say, uh, yeah, why do you ever want to visit Barbados? Uh, she often visits Barbados because her parents are from there. She goes to Barbados and, and, you know, whether it even rains a lot in Barbados or not, it doesn't matter if I know that. Uh, because I know where the Barbados is and I have a, a shared, you know, stereotypical even, whether it's stereotypical or not, doesn't matter. We have this image of countries like the Barbados of being sunny and warm, right? The opposite of cold and rainy London. And so I play on that, right? Why do you ever want to visit Barbados? when you have wonderful rainy weather here uh, and why do you need sunny the the sunny weather of Barbados was well, again she knows I'm joking right uh, she doesn't uh, she doesn't react and say well I go to I go to the Barbados because it's because it's uh, better weather right you ignore that right uh, she ignores the fact that uh, the me she ignores the surface meaning of what I say uh, why do you want to visit Barbados and reacts to the underlying uh, joke right we're both joking here right I could if we said this without any intention to, you know, not hilarious joke, but intention to slightly amuse each other, I'd come in, she'd say, it's raining. I assume, like most people, that you don't like that. And I would say, yes, I don't like the rain. I envy that you can go to the Barbados where I assume it is more often sunny. That's how we'd talk. And it would sound uh, very, everything would be literal and it would be... Um, well, it would be kind of funny, actually, if we did that at first, right? But eventually, it would, we'd just be, uh, there'd be no wordplay, right? No no shared knowledge of, of uh, well, I mean, even the fact that I acknowledge that she wants to visit Barbados shows that I know her, right? Or show, that she regularly visits the Barbados shows that I know her. Knowing something about someone is a sign of affection often, right? It, so I pay attention to you, right? I've got limited brain space, and I use some of it to keep track of your life, because you mean something to me, right? So that's what this allows us to do. Instead of just saying, raining, I don't like rain, you don't need it. Uh, good. Uh, it, it is the case that different genres of language uh, may rely more on different aspects of these shared information, right? If you think of a book, uh, the writer of a book, the author, she doesn't know you. Uh, so that she's unlikely to have shared interpersonal information. Uh, the writer doesn't know where you are, right? No shared situational information. Where are you reading this book? I can't rely on you reading it at home or on the bus or what have you. Maybe shared cultural information. If I'm a British author writing for typically British readers, I can expect certain shared cultural information. It doesn't mean you have to be British to read it, but you may find sometimes when you read a book from another Although it's in English, you know the language, but it's a, a written from a different cultural perspective. There may be things that you don't understand, right? When I used to, when I was a child in Canada, and I'd read British authors' books like like uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from the Tales of Narnia, and there'd be things that I didn't understand uh, because I, I knew the individual words, but I didn't have the cultural knowledge to understand what was going on all the time, right? Um, if you think of a comedy show, comedians often refer to the shared situation. They'll talk about people in the room. Uh, they'll talk about the city they're in, right? Whether it's they'll make jokes about the city they're in or the, or the town or the whatever geographical region in the United States. They might make jokes about that particular state or something, right? Uh, comedians can make lots of cultural jokes, right? Talk about people like me versus people like you or about people like us as a group, make fun of ourselves, right? Like that. Uh, interpersonal information doesn't really work, right? The comedian doesn't know the individuals. And even when comedians sometimes ask people, you know, what do you do for a living, sir? And the person says his job is an accountant. They can make jokes about accountants. But again, that relies on the shared cultural knowledge of accountants, right? There's these stereotypes of accountants being somewhat boring and staid and so on. But that's not relying on interpersonal information because he doesn't, the comedian doesn't really know that individual, right? Uh, he isn't, uh, he's not known as an individual. He's only known as a, as a cultural representation of an accountant. Uh, we don't really know whether he is boring or whether he's a funny and exciting, right? Uh, think of a work email, last example, right? You'd have some situational knowledge, the knowledge of the workplace, right? Uh, 
maybe some shared interpersonal information. Sometimes you'll say a little something about how have your kids been lately or what have you to people that you know well, uh, reasonably well at work, but not too much because the purpose is not of a work email is not to, to fatic, right? You're not trying to, to make friends. Uh, probably some cultural information, the culture of the workplace, the culture of your industry could all be part of that. Uh, so again, different genres of language, of, of language event will have different reliance on different types of shared information for the most part. But these are not rules. Here we're only talking about trends, right? Tendencies. Uh, so what I think you should do when you're thinking about this, how to do this, like for example, in your assessment, is look for places where there's information that's omitted, right? Something that would have to be said in another circumstance is omitted, but can be interpreted because of the shared situational, interpersonal, or cultural information. Uh, so you can try that now, if you, you could pause the video, uh, and then what I'd like you to do is, on Blackboard, you'll see a document called Cutting 2002, Analyzing Discourse in Context. Page one has a summary of what I've been saying here. Page two has some data, and I'd like you to try your own analysis of that data. Uh, look for at least one place where there's shared cultural, situational, and interpersonal information, right? Uh, you might look at, for example, for some hints, right? Try to do this on your own, but for some hints, right? I mean, you might look at the word here in line one. Uh, you might think carefully about line eight. What's that? Psycholinguistics? What's going on there with the, the words, not the that, the word psycholinguistics? This refers to something more here, right? When someone says, what's that? Psycholinguistics. What does psycholinguistics refer to here and how do you know and therefore what type of shared information are you relying on? Uh, maybe one more tip of a for a different type. I'm trying to give you one of each type here, but I'm not saying which is which. Uh, if you look at uh, you're not used, line seven, not used to that, are you? Not used to that, are you? What's being relied on here to communicate something without having said it? So you can try that. Uh, for as long as you'd like, uh, for the rest of the lecture time might be a suitable amount. And then if you read on Blackboard, Cutting's commentary on this is uh, posted for you. And then when we next meet, we can take up any questions or uh, comments you have about other things than what Cutting commented on. She didn't write about all of them, she wrote about some of the possibilities, and I suggested some other possibilities just now, right? So, uh, and here's the reference, right? Pragmatics and Discourse by Joan Cutting. Like I said, excellent, I think an excellent writer in terms of her communication skills to, to transfer a, a good idea, to, to explain ideas well, unlike what I'm doing right now, explaining them poorly. Good. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Bye.